Okay, can I, can I, can I, I want to ask a question. You know, one of the great things, it's London Fashion Week this week, or it was last week, and we're great at street culture. And street culture, we're not great at high art in that sense of Bach and, and Mozart. Street culture also is the, the, the gap between being a hustler and being an entrepreneur is a very thin gap. It's true, isn't it, John, that actually entrepreneurs and hustlers... Actually, one might say they're the same people just under a different nomenclature, and we've been rather good at them for a couple of hundred years or so. Yes, but I think that successful entrepreneurs um, require virtue. I think that long-term business success requires that, that you know, short-term advantage. Bad practice can succeed in the long term, but as economists are now discovering, the pursuit of shared value, social value, actually goes along with long-term secure eco economic advantage. And I think we've been sold a whole load of neoliberal myths that, um, in theory, we're now recovering from, but it's kind of seems a little too late in practice a lot of the time. Well, I'm impressed that Professor Milbank thinks that economists have suddenly discovered the virtue of what he's saying. In fact, the bonds of social trust are a theme very much contained within economic theory. Um, economics the it, economics yeah, sure. requires uh, uh, property rights, it requires the rule of law, and those regulate and guide our choices. The idea that we need some uh, instilling of moral character in order to make the system work seems to me both too hopeful and inherently authoritarian. Can I, can Tim, I, I was going I to say, in? Tim, I need you in here yeah. to talk about that. Yeah, I, I, I'm afraid the peaks and troughs thing is simply borne out by the facts. If yeah. you take uh, the chav, which I know is a very controversial term, but it's one we're all familiar with, uh, the, the experience, the phenomenon of the chav would be very familiar to the Georgians. Uh, in the early 18th century, uh, we, they went through something called the gin craze, where the price of gin plummeted. That was encouraged by the government. And mass drunkenness was very, very common. This is the age of Hogarth. This is the age of Gin Lane. And eventually the government had to step in to try and regulate uh, the trade. The point is that there is a link between government action, periods of immorality, and then trying to improve society in order to iron out those problems. Uh, the Georgian era was one in which faith was in the decline. The, uh, the values of the Enlightenment arguably actually did a lot of damage to public order in that sense. The, the Enlightenment leads to the French Revolution, leads to the excesses uh, of the Committee of Public Safety. Um, it's the 19th century reaction. It's the bourgeois uh, creation of an artificial morality, which I'm not saying it was right or wrong, but it was necessary all, in order to control the All moralities the urban are artificial, population. aren't they? I can't think of a natural morality, Oliver. Um, yes, they are. They are constructed by human beings. Well, they're constructed because we have common needs and find the best way in which to relate to each other. The, um, the historical background suggests, uh, as the banking crisis more recently does, that people respond to perverse incentives and given a plummeting price of liquor and a uh, few opportunities to enjoy themselves, then it seems to me that uh, public drunkenness is, is likely to, to result. Um, the, 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 the proper response, uh, I'm a firm believer in government action in order to uh, intervene in the economic system, redistribute wealth, allow people to make autonomous choices, but to direct those choices seems to me um, largely uh, a forlorn quest and one that will create a very unfair society. Well, I was going to say, John, do you think, as it were, that what I'm, I think listening to you, you would speak of as the marketization of society is in certain ways left a kind of moral vacuum? Absolutely, and I think that's only part of the picture. If you like, it's the um, kind of atheism that my colleague's recommending, working out in practice. I think ordinary people are much cleverer in a way that, than academics, and they realise that if really the only thing that's real is kind of material needs and, you, you know, abstract negative liberty, then obviously good and evil aren't real. They, they are, as he's saying, just artificial. And it's not always, uh, doesn't always make sense to obey the rules. It often makes rational sense sense to break them. This is why people like Nietzsche were so much more intelligent, you know, than, than British utilitarians. Ordinary people get the message, you know, good and evil are no longer real. And this is, this is what follows from that. Absolutely. You know, and, when, and when we're talking about this kind of law and order imposed by moral theologians, we are not just talking about crime and punishment. In the 19th century, the people who were cleaning out the slums, who were helping people out of prostitution, exactly. who were fighting opium, fighting drink addiction, they're also the Christian moral theologians who are trying to impose a sense of moral order on society. The two historically go hand in hand. Okay, well then, let us look sure. forward to the future. 
OK, let's look forward kind of 20 or 30 years. John, what do you think needs to be done, that old Lenin question, what needs to be done in order to, as it were, remedy the situation you think we're in? I think we've got to start by being gentle with each other and um, debate with each other um, about what we really want and where we see each other as, com as harmonising in different roles. And I think that means building up genuine community, you know, not being led by the market nor by bureaucracy, but actually a kind of combination of real participatory democracy um, with, with genuine virtuous leadership of good people and a kind of reciprocal interaction between those things. And I think that's beginning to happen on the local level because people can't really live without the collapse of trust and belief in the good and its reality forever. Oliver? Yes, when I, when I hear about participatory democracy I feel for my wallet. What about the people who what actually do? don't want to be part of it, who want to choose their own interests, their own occupations, look after their children, look after their garden, pray if you like, read books and don't have anything except horror at the sort of authoritarianism you're prescribing. I've what called you a you crank in them? print and I call you again a crank now. Why, why, why is well, it authoritarian? It's all you're just to trying it. to evade the argument, aren't you, by introducing something totally irrelevant because you're losing the argument very badly. Uh, sorry, what was your question, Phil? <laughs> the question is, why is it authoritarian? Why is the belief in participatory democracy necessarily authoritarian? Because it's a recipe for inviting the best organised, most vocal pressure groups to supplant individual choice. And that seems to me an extremely unpleasant, unattractive society. And if you go back to the 19th century, Tim, so do you think you how, Oliver, how Oliver has described kind of moral rescue counts as authoritarianism then? It does, but I would rather... I would rather the authoritarianism than the anarchy. British politics in the 19th century was a lot like American politics today. It was infused with evangelical Christianity, and that was absolutely central to ending things like child labor. All I would add is that whilst I'm sympathetic to the argument that we need a bit of authoritarianism, I'm pessimistic about its ability to actually achieve anything, because I take a Hobbesian view that people are naturally sinful, and any <clears throat> attempt to make them good probably is only going to lead to greater social conflict. Well, that's very good to hear. I assume the agnostic. What about the religious figure, John? Well, you, you know, I'm much more optimistic than that because original sin doesn't mean we're evil by nature. Um, it just means that we're slightly harmed and we can overcome that and we can overcome it um, by, by cooperating and being guided, guided by, by genuine wisdom. And, you know, the, the idea that we've got free choice at the moment when we're manipulated all the time and increasingly controlled by minority oligarchy is so laughable it's not really worth commenting on. Oliver? Last word to you, if the individual is paramount and should be able to determine their interests, how do we adjudicate between the different moral values in this pluralistic world that you've described? We don't adjudicate between them. We have uh, a, a set of constraints, the rule of law, certain clear boundaries for what government can and can't do. I think government is... Uh, the, the role of government in intervening in order to protect people, to redistribute wealth in order to make autonomous choices is a, a very civilised principle. Uh, but more broadly, I think people should have the ability to choose for themselves and the decline of religion, which is the most divisive force in British society, is one I greatly welcome. Um, well, I, I, I can see John's <laughs> lost for words, but I'm not going <laughs> to allow him to be lost for words. I, I think, to me, it, it's completely obvious that unless we recover some sense of the reality of, of, the, of the transcendent good and have faith in that, um, in guiding and, and shaping our lives, we won't have any sense of common purpose. We won't understand what we're all doing together. We'll all be divided okay, from but each I, other. I was brought and up... power and money will rule, as Oliver wants. You know? Amen. Amen. I, <laughs> I was brought up a Methodist. Go, which so reminds yeah. me that repentance is unlike innocence, which, if I understand it, means actually there's no way back. You don't really think we're going to enter a kind of feudal religious order, do you? You don't. <laughs> Certainly not, no. I think we need a, you know, a much more democratic version of communitarianism to, to emerge in the future. But I think you always do need a blend of the participation of the many and the guidance of the few. Uh, the point at the moment we have is 
the people in charge are, are just completely nasty because unless you have some sense of the honour of, 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 of the leaders, that's inevitably what results. It sounds to me as though that religious remains at least a divisive issue around this table. Thanks very much to John Milbank, to Oliver Cam, and to Tim Stanley, who I did think I hear said amen down the line from Washington. Thank you all very much indeed.